only cover a few things to introduce her. Um, she's not only an expert in foreign language writing and well known for her book teaching, writing in second and foreign language classrooms um, and many articles um, that she has published on different aspects of foreign language writing skills. Uh, as for example, the role of writing and writing instruction uh, in L2 development um, and tutoring and revision second language writers uh, in the writing center. Um, but she's also been well known for second language acquisition theory uh, research, uh, publishing articles, for example, um, on the role of instruction in second language acquisition theories. Um, but she's also well, well known uh, for a best-selling book in second language acquisition. And that really means something, a bestseller in SLA, an <laughs> academic book. Sold um, more than 12 copies. It was yeah. a bestseller. <laughs> um, in uh, any kind of aspect of the uh, research and theory of uh, focus on form, she has been applying her theoretical knowledge to writing textbooks, uh, and last I counted, uh, I think there are six textbooks already, so um, <laughs> that's quite a bit, but of course, you know, applying it is, is very crucial. Um, without further ado, I'll pass on the stage, um, and uh, uh, today's talk is going to be about teachers' response in L2 writing instruction. So, um, I'm passing it off to you. Thank you. Okay, as you could uh, glean from the fr uh, um, frantic activity of the podium before uh, Susanna spoke, uh, we're having a little challenge here. And I'm always a little bit challenged, but right now after, you know, getting it all perfectly prepared and synchronized and everything like that, I'm actually going to have to use two different machines, one for me and my notes and one for something that you see. And I'll have to click twice, so I'll probably forget at some point and get out of sync. So you may have to say, click, or, or not. I'm not an admin, so it's not my machine. I'm not going to do this without technology. <laughs> OK. If it happens again, I'll run out of If it happens again, well, we'll see. OK. So I also have to keep going back and forth with my glasses. So there's just a lot of cognitive overload going on here. All right, so uh, teacher response in L2 writing instruction. Um, teachers obviously respond to many different aspects of writing. And um, here we go, click again. Probably the most important thing is um, content and organization. But form is probably more important in L2 writing instruction than in L1 writing instruction because L2 writers are I mean, L2 uh, writing instructors are de facto L2 instructors as well. So L2 writing instructors spend a whole lot of time responding to language errors. A lot of people have called these lower order concerns, but in my field, we don't like that idea of lower order concerns. So we usually refer to it as written corrective feedback, and that's, um, uh, I think, was it, what my talk was billed as being about. Um, okay, one of these. All right, so um, why are you all here today? Are you, are you looking for? <laughs> I thought so. Well, um, all right, so get mine going. If you are here coming looking for the magic bullet, you may leave disappointed. Um, I don't really have one for you today. However, I do hope I'll be able to give you some insight into, um, into the general topic of written corrective feedback um, based on research um, over the last 10 years or so uh, in the field. OK, next. So written corrective feedback. Uh, you may recognize her. Um, so do you, when you get uh, second language papers back, do you Correct your learner's errors, do you, or at least respond to them? Show of hands? Yes, OK. So why do you do that? Anybody have an idea? Yeah, <laughs> Kathleen. Sorry? OK, so, so just to make sure that they know they're on the wrong path. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so we, we do seem to automatically accept that responding to error is good practice. Um, but 
but not everybody agrees. Um, why should we bother with written corrected feedback? Well, Kathleen has given one, one possibility. It, it certainly takes an enormous amount of your time. So um, we should probably have a good reason for doing it. And one might be, I'm oh, sorry, I'm a little behind myself here. Click, click. Um, one might be that students want it. And they do, they do want it. Um, and it's, um, uh, that's important, but is it enough? Um, maybe, we do need to, to take into account sort of the affective factors and perhaps if it's a tuition driven institution that you work at, if they're paying for it, you do need to give them what they want. Um, but probably the most important reason why we give corrective feedback is we think it works. So, I think given the amount of time that we spend giving written corrective feedback, we probably want to know the answer to this. Is written corrective feedback effective? And here I am talking about you know, language level um, written corrective feedback. I'm not talking about content, organization, that sort of thing. So, um, to answer this question, probably we're going to need to know, first of all, um, what we mean by effective. You know, you're always supposed to start by defining your terms. So we want to know what it means to be effective. How will we know it when we see it, effectiveness? And how will we know if anything that we've done has contributed to it? So I want to begin with a, a couple of different possibilities for defining effectiveness. Um, first, we could mean improvement on a feature or some set of features in the next draft. And this is often referred to as feedback for accuracy. Um, so you get a bunch of papers, you spend until midnight grading them or responding to them uh, on various things, including language level features, and um, you hand it back to them and you tell them to look at your, the feedback you've given and to, to, to revise accordingly. And they do. And so you think, wow, I made a difference. So that's one possibility. A second possibility would be improvement on a feature in the next paper. So that would be a somewhat broader and perhaps hmm, arguably more valid uh, definition of effectiveness so that not only is the um, next draft that they turn back to you as a result of your feedback, but the next time you assign a paper, some of the things that you talked to them or wrote uh, um, feedback on in the previous assignment might actually show up in some changed manner in this new draft. So that, that, would, be a, that would be a good thing. Um, or we could think about it more broadly still, catch up with myself, in terms of L2 development. And here I want to just pause briefly to talk about um, this more general picture. Now, um, writing is sort of a, a stepchild in SLA, in second language acquisition, and is generally considered, well, output in general, but writing in particular, is usually the last thing we think about as having any kind of role in second language development. Uh, generally, we think of input-driven uh, language development through, through um, spoken language or through reading. And so this idea that writing or any part of writing instruction might be helpful in language development is relatively new and relatively, well, not, not, I think probably not, not just not widely accepted, but probably not widely thought about. So this would be the broadest way of thinking about it, and this is why it's called feedback for acquisition, that um, perhaps if you thought about, if you had some sort of a pretest, not necessarily on specific forms, but some general proficiency test, and then they received feedback on a number of features over a period of time, and then there was some sort of post-test, that there was actually development, language development, that you could attribute to what you had done. So that would be the broadest way of thinking about it. Um, OK, so what have uh, scholars in the field said about this? Well, fundamentally, there are two sides. It is or it isn't, sort of, except I'll probably get away from that two sides. But the first side being uh, basically what most people think, that is that um, written corrective feedback is a good thing, with a few caveats. 
yes, it can be effective under the right conditions. And here you can see I've hedged even further by not talking about acquisition, but talking about engaging learning mechanisms. So, um, and even then with some caveats, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about each of these as I continue, but let me just mention briefly what I mean here. So the right target, it may be that your feedback is most effective only on certain things, certain uh, linguistic features, and on other things you might as well not bother. So we need to know what's the right target. Maybe not everything is the same. The right timing, there are a couple of ways to think about this, but, but this idea that you need to deliver the feedback at the time when it's the optimal, it's time when, when it's most needed or most useful. So we wanna know about that. And then finally, the thing that you've all come here for, the magic bullet, that is the right kind of feedback. What's the best kind of feedback? And I actually will give you a little bit of a, a, a clue on that. Um, because I think there's some uh, literature that has started, be has begun to answer that question. Okay, so that's, that's the yes, it, it, it works side. And then on the other side is one man, John Truscott, uh, whom if you've uh, done any reading on this, you may have seen a series of his articles. And, um, oops, this one. So, and he says, he's a, he's a um, professor at a university in Taiwan, and he says there's no evidence that, that written corrective feedback is effective. And in fact, you really shouldn't do it because it takes valuable time away from what you really should be doing, and that is teaching them to write. I mean, the real stuff, the good stuff, the ideas, the content, that kind of stuff. And you should just not do this language-based stuff. Now, you might think, well, there's the, the rest of the world, and then there's Truscott. Why am I bothering with this lone kook? Well, um, in fact, I think that it's really very much worth listening to what he says. I'm going to give a little, just a tiny, tiny bibliography at the end. Um, mostly, it, there's a, one book that I'll recommend and just a couple of articles, and his is in there. And his is pretty old, so that shows you how much I think we really ought to be thinking about what he says. Um, and the reason I'm including it is because he has a point. He says that no one has shown that written corrective uh, feedback is effective. And until very recently, I'd say he's right. Yeah, really. So, where do we go from there? I took this from Richard Cameron. This is one of his favorite expressions. So, so, so what are we going to do about this? Um, you would think that uh, this is a pretty straightforward question. You know, does it work or not? Why don't we know the answer? Or maybe more to the point, what's the matter with the research? Or what's the matter with the researchers? Um, and that pretty much can come down to one answer, and that has to do with research design. For those of you who are studying this, um, I think I have sort of a split audience here, so some of the things that I'm gonna go through for those of you who are in second language acquisition will be familiar. For those of you who are in uh, cultural studies or literature, maybe less so. But uh, this area of the field has been fraught with design woes, design woes some of which are uh, uh, justified or at least explicable, others maybe not so much so. So I want to go through um, go through these and talk about some of the problems. There have been, I'd say, two recent studies, both of which will appear on the last slide, um, that have begun to solve some of these uh, problems. And two in particular really have, uh, one in 2010, one in 2012, have begun to show that written corrective feedback is in fact superior to control, that is uh, just writing, or to just self-editing. You know, just go back and correct your stuff. Um, both in the short term, subsequent draft, and in the longer term, subsequent papers. But before I get there, I wanna just talk about what some of the problems have been and how challenging it is to solve some of them. A lot of the, the early studies have been sort of, mm, I guess, action research really. Uh, a single teacher deciding what she usually wants to do and um, to try and find um, the answers to the questions that you're all wondering about as well. So first problem, no delayed measures. And I think I've already alluded to that, this idea that if you say, okay, here's your paper back, go look and see what I wrote and go revise based on it. And it comes back and lo and behold, they fixed a lot of stuff and you say, effectiveness of written corrective feedback. 
But unless you, you have some sort of measure down the road to see that whether, it's, whether it sticks, you really don't have much of a valid claim that what you did was much good at all. So that's the first thing. Oop, second thing. OK, second thing, no control group, classic. Um, and this should also be familiar to you. But it's, it's surprising the number of studies that were done on written corrective feedback that don't have any. So um, even if they do have a delayed post-test, so hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to have this great new way of giving written corrective feedback. I'm going to give it to my class. And then I'm, at the end of the semester, I'm going to check on how they've done. And hey, they got really, really better. And so we have written corrective feedback uh, as successful unless you know that there wasn't something else. I mean, chances are they're not going, all of your students are not going out and finding some, some grammar instruction on YouTube or something like that. But they might. You don't know. Maybe one of their other teachers is providing this. So unless you really know what the, what's happening, um, uh, you know, that, that what you're doing is the reason for why they're getting better. And the only way you can really find that out is if you have an equivalent set of students who are not doing it. So that's, that's been one of the biggest problems of a whole slew of studies that have looked at this issue. Um, no initial measure to show the, group, the two groups were equivalent. OK, so if you have, um, uh, two classes. So you're teaching two classes. And you think, ah, I've got my control group. Everything's going to be great. I'm going to give one. Uh, group my uh, written corrective feedback treat treatment, and the other group gets nothing. And I'll talk about problems with that in a minute. And then I'm going to test them later, and I'm going to really find the answer. Well, if you don't know anything about how they started out, it's difficult to, again, to attribute what you've found to what you've done. So for instance, you have your 8 o'clock class, then you have your 11 o'clock class, teaching the same thing. One is getting the treatment. One is not getting the treatment. And, uh, and you find that, hey, wow, the, treated, the one that gets the treatment does so much better. Well, maybe that 8 o'clock class that you gave the written feedback to, they're the kind of, they get up really early, they're really gung-ho, they're really motivated. And, and um, so that class is really actually rather different. Or it might be the other way, that the, bun that the 8 o'clock class is a bunch of slackers who couldn't even get it together to register in time. It's the only class that they could get into. <laughs> And they stagger in halfway through the class. They never turn in their homework. So you don't really know until you know that the two groups are relatively equal or not equal and you correct for it in some other way, you're not going to be able to draw conclusions. Um, oops. Next one. Uh, no assurance that the treatment other than the written corrective feedback uh, is equivalent. Oh, I'm, I meant to mention one other thing about the, um, uh, the third point there. And, one of the issues about trying to come up with two different classes, one that gets the treatment and one that doesn't, with written corrective feedback is particularly difficult and almost an ethical issue because um, students really are convinced that it helps and that they want it. The idea of withholding it from one of your groups can become a real problem. Um, I know there are a couple of researchers who tried it and practically ended up with a riot on their hands. And again, if you do have a tuition-driven situation, it become, can become even more of a problem. Anyway, so fourth one, no assurance that the treatment other than the written corrective feedback was equivalent. And this is um, more common in, um, uh, you know, when you have a professor coming from the university, sort of parachuting into a school or a program and saying, I'm here to do my research. Uh, you, got, you do this in your class, and you do that in your class, and I'll be back next week to give them a test. It's a little bit of a character, but that, that kind of, of um, split can sometimes happen between university researchers and, and classroom teachers. And um, even though you may assign one condition to one and another condition to another, unless you are you know, really aware of what's going on in, in that classroom, you may not be able to really trust your results either. So for instance, um, maybe the teacher to whom you assign the no feedback option mm, is not really completely down with that idea. OK, she doesn't give any feedback, but she says, hey, but they got to get it somehow. And I'm just going to give them a little grammar lesson. I'm going to give them a little relative clause lesson here. And you, you never even knew that. So that can be an issue as well. 
um, sometimes the experimental conditions can introduce problems of their own. So for instance, if you're saying, okay, this, in this group, uh, you look at what I've done, uh, rewrite your essays, uh, bring it back tomorrow, you may have uh, introduced a confounding variable like they, they, they just spend more time doing it. Presumably that could help. They could just be doing more writing. Often in experimental conditions, they do more writing. And the final thing uh, you may not quite think about, but uh, written corrective feedback actually has kind of two parts. There's the feedback that you provide, and then there's the what they do with it. So it may be that um, uh, what they do in response to your feedback is as important as what you do. So you could even divide that. You could say, here, look at this, read it, um, and then take it away again. Or look at this, read what I've done, now do something about it. So um, those, two th those two things are actually divisible. Um, okay. Um, then um, two other things. One, this is something that uh, Truscott has railed about, and that is um, what might be the impact outside of language development, beyond language development, of having a fairly vigorous written corrective feedback program. So if um, learners know that this is going to be an issue and that, that there, there's a high stake or any stake at all in linguistic accuracy, it's very possible and actually has been documented that they'll contract. Stop writing so much, write simple sentences so you don't get errors in them, and just generally avoid risk taking. And um, we know in, in second language acquisition that in order to push into language forward, in order to, for language to develop, people have to, to try out their hypotheses. They have to do a little risk taking. And so it, it's possible that um, written corrective feedback could have a chilling effect on, on these issues. Okay, the last, um, I'm going to put both of these up at once. Get them both on together. Um, this is something that really has to do less with the pedagogy and more to do with the research itself. And I'll talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. Extensive, um, uh, an extensive focus or an intensive focus. Sometimes they're also called, um, um, what's the other thing they call it? I'll get to the next slide. So extensive focus is really basically what you do naturally. That is, the errors that come in, you give them feedback. Whatever comes in, you just do it. Intensive feedback, you would decide either a priori or perhaps after seeing a couple of papers and seeing where they have problems, say, I'm going to focus on this one thing or these two things um, and only give feedback on those. Um, now, the extensive focus, because it's sort of scattershot and they're getting uh, you know, one, one piece of feedback on articles and this on verb tense and this on complex sentences, it's really hard as a researcher to, to capture that because there's just so little effect from one thing. So that, that creates a problem. The intensive one, you're more likely to be able to see the effect if you, you know, hit the articles over and over and over and over again. But there's a whole issue of ecological validity. I mean, you're going to turn your, your students' papers back with just all the articles collected, um, corrected or responded to or whatever. It just doesn't make that much sense as a classroom teacher. So those are some of the problems um, with that. So I want to just continue talking about this a little bit, the different kinds of feedback you can get. And certainly we know that not all written corrective feedback is the same. And the first, uh, I, I'm going to sort of cross-cut writ written corrective feedback in two ways. The first one is the one that I've just discussed, and that is the intensive, focused is the other word that's sometimes used. Uh, these are the two kinds, intensive and um, uh, extensive, otherwise known as focused and unfocused. So, you know, when I talked earlier in a very early slide about the right kind of treatment, we begin to try and get at it here. We actually have beginning to get a little bit of evidence of, of what kinds might work best, but of course, even in that, we could add the, but it depends on the context, on the learners, and all those sorts of things. Um, so, intensive feedback. Um, we do know there's, there's been much more research done on um, corrective feedback of oral language than there is of written uh, language in L2, not, not in L1, not in first language, but in second language. So uh, much of the research on uh, 
oral feedback suggests that this, this intensive treatment works best. So if you decide in a speaking class to really concentrate on one thing and consistently provide feedback on that, there's generally been a pretty positive effect for that. That's been pretty well documented. So there, there may be some sense in which this makes sense for written uh, feedback as well. Um, but again, we have this issue of this sort of ecological validity. Can you really give up looking at all the other errors and just really focus on a couple of them? What would students think? That goes back to, the, the, I think, the point Kathleen made in the beginning when I asked, you want them to know what they're doing right and what they're doing wrong. And if you focus just on one or two things, it might, um, I mean, you could come to some agreement with them. Listen, guys, I'm not going to correct everything. Today, we're just going to work on x, y, and z. But still, it can be somewhat misleading. The uh, extensive or unfocused one um, can be hard for students to process. There's so many different things. You know, they just can't focus on, on four or five very, very, you know, once in morphology and spelling and sentence boundaries, and it's, it can be just too much to do at once. So that's one way of, of sort of bifurcating the, um, the feedback question. Another one is to look at indirect versus direct feedback. Now, uh, just to explain for those of you who are not in the biz, um, indirect feedback does not provide any of what we call positive evidence. And positive evidence is just a fancy word for the right answer. So positive evidence is any kind of information about what, what the target is really like, what is correct in the target language. So um, indirect feed, d feedback does not provide any of that positive evidence. Um, there are a couple of different um, types. And when I finish this slide, I'll, give you, I'll show you some actual concrete examples. Um, just telling a notation that is, there's a problem here. And that's probably not very effective with L2 learners. I'll show you an example in a second. Location, so not telling you what the problem is or how to fix it, but here's where it is. And the third one you may be familiar with, either from your own experience as a student or perhaps also as a teacher, is uh, showing where it is and also saying what the problem is, generally using some sort of codes like VT and, and uh, WW and awk, or probably not awk, but uh, those sorts of codes to tell what the, what the problem is. But again, not saying how to fix it. So why on earth would you do that? Why are you trying to hide? What, you know, what's the secret? Why are you trying to hide the important information from the students? Is there any advantage to doing it this way? Well, yes, supposedly there is. And this also has been documented in oral uh, correction. This idea that um, making learners do some of the work, not just handing it to them, that you want them to do the retrieval to figure out what it is, to struggle with it a little bit, and actually do some sort of production, in this case, writing. Um, this sort of generative use of, of language um, is said to help them process it more deeply and to uh, more likely to anchor it in, in long-term memory. Of course, if they don't have that knowledge in any, you know, at any point in their memory, and they don't have a clue of what you're asking them to do, this is not going to be very effective. And I'll talk a little bit more about timing on that in a minute. Uh, so that's indirect feedback. Direct, obviously the other one, is the type of feedback that provides the positive evidence. This is what you've done wrong, and this is what you need to do to fix it. Um, there um, uh, are a couple of kinds there. You can just supply the answer, and you might uh, also give some sort of metalinguistic information some rule or something like that that they might be able to use in future similar sorts of examples. And there is, again, some of these more recent studies have been suggesting that this is um, more effective. But I, I'm going to really come back to some caveats on that, um, because I, th I think there are clear advantages to both types for different kinds of errors. So I'll talk more about that in a second. OK, first I'm going to go through a couple of, I just took these off the web, and they're really horrible, and you probably won't be able to 
read them, but uh, read them very well. But I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of each of these types in the flesh. OK, so this is notation. So there's little x's there, presumably, like, hey, there are two errors in this line. I couldn't even find them. But um, <laughs> this is called minimal marking. It really has been championed in L1, in first language, native speaker composition. I think it's probably close to useless for L2 writers. So we won't spend any more time on that. Uh, second one, note, uh, notation. Here is, a, yeah, you're not going to be able to read it. I can't even read it. Um, but I, it pleased me very much to get your letter after so long time. So so long is uh, underlined, so the learner will know there's something wrong with so long. Don't know what it is, but I know that's it. So that's the um, location uh, one. So it's a, a little less vague. And then the codes uh, that we all know and love, um, except I did on the wrong computer. There we go. So uh, he lived with her sister. So VT, WC, WC, what's that word choice, spa, spelling, word form, all those kinds of things. So if you understand the codes, and that's always an if, um, you'll be able to know not just what the error is, uh, where the error is, but what the problem is, but still not how to fix it. So that's the last one, the direct one. And again, I just ripped this off some website where it tells you uh, where it is and what to do about it, the actual correction. Now, of course, there's always the danger that they'll simply copy what you wrote, turn it back into you, and whoosh, that's done. So the effectiveness of direct feedback is only going to be as good as the students who use it. So it, you know, just copying it and not paying any attention to it is um, uh, uh, a, a good possibility. And I'll talk a little bit more about the study that showed its effectiveness and talk why I think it might have been. OK, so those are the different kinds of feedback that are possible. It's also um, uh, the mode of delivery can vary and can vary in uh, its effectiveness, um, depending on, again, the circumstances. For written corrective feedback to be effective, of course, students have to notice the correction. And they have to notice that it is a correction, not just like a suggestion that you did this wrong and you need to fix it. So um, when you think about written correction, usually it occurs in one of two places, margins, final. Margins tend to be the language stuff, and the final tends to be in the sort of a summative couple of sentences, maybe a paragraph. If you're in the first year writing program, maybe several paragraphs. Um, but that tends to be more about the content and organization, maybe a little bit of something on, on language. So what do you figure would be easier for the learning mechanisms to notice? Marginal notations or final? You think final? Why do you think final? Because it's just at the end? No, I just, I, I know for myself, and I was just talking about this with Shiloh, uh, that you know, when I've gotten papers back and there's little things written in the uh -huh. margins, a lot of times it's just kind of like, Overload. we just look at what's written. OK. I, you know, I don't think anybody's really looked at this in L2 writers. I think that the little sound bites, the little things on the end, might be perceived as easier to fix. Maybe they'd go to it first. and. Um, it's possible, I think, that summative commentary at the end, particularly if it's long, might just end up in a drawer. I don't, I don't know. Again, I think it depends on the teacher. Uh, I mean, it depends on the students. Um, but any kind of written feedback, and I'll include here electronic feedback, does have the advantage of permanence. And again, comparing this to what we know about oral corrective feedback for L2 learners, um, you know, when you get a correction, um, uh, from in conversation, you may not even notice that it's a correction. Um, it could be just conversational back and forth. And you certainly, even if you notice that it was a correction, you can't hold it. You can't stop it and keep it. Whereas written, um, in the written form, first of all, it's really hard to mistake it for anything but corrective feedback. It's usually not going to be just a little conversational gambit when it's from your teacher in writing. Um, and um, so it's, it's clearly corrective. And it's also something that they can go back to and look at, again, depending on the, on the student to actually do it. But um, it does have that advantage. 
you can provide oral feedback. Some people do um, do it in recordings, like on voice boards or something like that. Um, and that does have the drawback of not being permanent. But I do want to mention one thing about um, conferences and the advantages that, that, that they confer, teacher-student conferences. We do have some evidence from uh, student-teacher conferences and from um, tutoring, writing center tutoring sessions that the uh, areas of focus, whether it's language issues or something broader, um, content, organization, whatever, if they are topics that are either nominated by the writer, by the student, or at least uh, ones in which they enter into some negotiation with the teacher or the tutor, they are the ones that are most likely to be fo uh, the focus of revision. So although the oral uh, mode does have some disadvantages, it also has the, this potential for interaction that writing doesn't have and can be very useful. Um, and then finally, there's the timing. And uh, I think this is perhaps a little less controversial. If, if you provide feedback on the last draft and there's nothing they ever have to do again with the last draft, chances of its being useful is probably slight. Unless, I suppose, if you were doing some sort of a portfolio project where they have to come back and use all, a number of different um, uh, assignments and have to act upon them in some way. Otherwise, I would think that the between draft um, uh, corrective feedback would be more, um, more effective. OK, so um, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the actual target of the feedback. Um, these are sort of the standard ones that have been given in the past. What should I correct? There's so much out here. What should I focus on? These three things have often been discussed. Impede, um, well, just in general, I would say that the decision would be based on the importance of the error in the context of the writing, um, the context of the whole course, or the status in the learner's interlanguage. And those are the, really these three things. So uh, if you come across a passage and you don't know what the heck they're talking about at all, completely confusing, this is probably an area that you want to focus on. I rather doubt if that's the case, you'll be able to give one sort of correction. It's not like use a different article here. That's going to be a lot messier. But that's one guideline. The previous pedagogical focus, you've been working on relative clauses for two weeks. And there it is. Bang. You can't do it. So that might be a sense in which you think you can hold them accountable for it. Um, and then this treatable is a word that's been used a lot in the literature. I'm not really crazy about the sort of medical metaphor. But um, this is the idea that um, if there's something that runs through the piece systematically, the, er the errors that are repeated, same sort of errors, then you might get a little more bang for the buck. The idea that you, if you correct the um, the use of a particular tense in one instance, you might get some sort of projection onto others. I think that's a little bit um, probably more optimistic than is warranted, but you know, it's it's an idea. Um, but I think that knowing something about the status of that feature or of that error in the learner's interlanguage, and again, this is you know, dreaming. You've got 24 students in your class, and you're supposed to be aware of each one of them. But still, I will continue. Um, there are, you know, how, what can you hold learners responsible for? We've talked about different kinds of feedback that might be appropriate for different kinds of situations. I think a rule of thumb is that the earlier they are in acquiring something, the earlier they are in the, in the process of acquisition, the shakier their knowledge is going to be, and the more um, necessity there will be for more direct feedback. Um, so for instance, if the, um, um, if the form is a fairly newly acquired one, stop. Um, stop. All right. Um, if, the, if it's a fairly newly acquired form, um, prompts, that is, this, this kind of thing, this indirect feedback where you were relying on them to go and figure out what it is, those are going to be useless because they don't have any, any language to draw on. 
this kind of situation is obviously going to call for more direct feedback. You're going to have to actually tell them how to fix it. Um, if you have a form that I'm calling partially acquired, this thing is doing something wrong. There we go, sorry. Um, it's likely if, if the forms are partially acquired, they're, so they're in the, sort of in the process of it, they've started to, to maybe produce it, but not always produce it correctly. Um, this is where I think the written corrective feedback will probably be the most helpful, and might, you might be, begin to be able to go to a more indirect uh, form of feedback here. If the forms are well established, um, and we often call these mistakes as opposed to errors, if they're well established, then you, um, these are ones that you obviously are more likely to be able to hold learners accountable for and um, are more amenable to the, most, the least direct uh, forms of feedback. OK, so I'm, I'm moving towards the end here. Um, a couple of, I want to just talk about a couple of different approaches that have been a, uh, attempted in, um, that are perhaps a little bit more unified. I'm, the traditional sort of ad hoc way of uh, doing this is, you know, correct what you find. What's out there, something that particularly ticks you off, something you've been teaching, something you're interested in, whatever, just kind of ad hoc. But um, a couple of SLA, uh, second language writing um, professionals have been trying to develop a more unified, a little bit more ground, theoretically grounded approach to the kinds of work that might be more effective here. And I'm gonna talk about three of them very, very briefly. And for those of you who have a background in SLA, um, you can turn off your recorders. So the first one is sociocultural theory. And um, in three sentences or less, sociocultural theory basically um, claims that all learning is social. All learning takes place in a social context and that essentially we learn everything twice. First, we learn under the uh, guidance of a more capable performer, and when we can't do it ourselves, uh, but we can do it under their guidance, and then later on we learn to do it ourselves, the so-called move, the move from other regulation to self-regulation. And during that period, we are in what's called the ZPD, the Zone of Proximal Development. And this is kind of, this pretty much what I was talking about in the last slide about partially acquired forms. And uh, let's see. So the kinds of feedback that uh, sociocultural theorists suggest for second language writers is that it be done within this so-called ZPD, that you um, provide, so that you as the more, um, uh, more competent professional will be providing this assistance and you provide sort of just as much as they need, just as direct as they need, and as they begin to develop and be able to do more and more by themselves, you withdraw the assistance. And that assistance is also to be given, I call it just in time, borrowing from accounting, that, um, that, it's, that it's provided sort of at the, at the moment of making meaning. And that's why um, conferences can be particularly useful in this. And the one study that's really shown this to be effective was in a, a tutoring situation. So graduated, contingent, negotiated, that is um, that the learner participates in some way and gets to, gets to have a say in, in how this is done. So that's, that's one of them. The second one is uh, one that is probably much more um, familiar to those of you who are steeped in mainstream second language acquisition, and this is a, what I'm calling a cognitive interactional approach. And uh, uh, this is um, connected to sort of standard constructs of SLA, like um, interaction, noticing, negotiation, so forth. And um, so successful feedback within this framework depends on developmental readiness, this idea that you're only gonna be able to learn if you're ready to learn, if you've gone through the developmental stages that make um, the next step that you're going to provide to them available to you, it uh, requires that, that, that learners actually notice. Um, and this, you know, we've talked a lot about already about how that might happen. Um, it um, 
depends on deeper processing, learners actually doing something with the, with the feedback that you give them, not just sort of saying, uh-huh, and that they have some stake in it, this idea of learner um, engagement, uh, as I discussed before in the um, tutoring sessions and in the conferences, if, the learner, if we're focusing on what the learners want to focus on, it's more likely to be effective. Okay, so that, those are two approaches. And the final one that I want to mention is uh, the, um, it was done in this one study that I said is really showing some effects. And they, they're calling it a dynamic approach. It's a group of researchers that have sort of brought together everything that's been done and what is known about um, second language um, writing and within the SLA framework and, and tried to kind of field test it. So it's, it's based on still another theory of, of second language acquisition called skill theory. And that's the idea that, that knowledge um, can be um, learned in an explicit way first, and then proceduralized, that is, made available uh, as implicit knowledge um, through a process that has often been, uh, had a bad reputation in second language learning and teaching through practice. Um, and uh, they require extensive practice, but they do, they um, stress also that the need for practice be authentic. So they, they say that the, um, the practice has to be of authentic writing, and it can't be like, go practice a lot of those, those uh, slot and filler drills, and then come back and, and make sure that it appears in your writing. It's never, ever going to work. I think all of us know that. So authentic practice, and um, the feedback within this um, method is based on learner need, once again, very similar to what we've talked about before. I think I'll just go through here and do it once. Um, it has to be comprehensible, so if they can't figure out the codes or what you've said to them, it's not going to be useful. I think that goes without saying. Contingent, once again, giving the feedback to them just as they need it. Constant, and this is the one hallmark of this. In this study, they did, and I'll just do the last one, they did very short readings, so that's where the manageable comes in. They did very short um, uh, writing samples. And then they got feedback on it. Then they revised it. And they did this over and over and over again until they, their passage was error free. And they did this through the course of the semester. And they found that um, uh, there was not just better on those particular assignments, but there was a real improvement in language proficiency. Um, and there was not um, any detriment to the complexity of the writing or to the content or other rhetorical concerns. But this is incredibly time consuming and perhaps not practical. And the other thing that I uh, would like to note is that um, I've seen some nodding heads here about, not nodding off, but just nodding, um, <laughs> that uh, you know, it depends so much on what the learners do with your feedback. And this particular study was done at BYU. And I have to think that you know, maybe they're a little more gung-ho than some of the rest of our students because they kept rewriting and rewriting and rewriting the same thing over and over again until they were error free. So I don't know how, it was a good study, it had positive results, but again, practical, don't know. Okay, so um, that's sort of what I wanted to say about feedback. And what I wanna mention now is what happens after feedback. We've talked about what teachers do, but what about the learners? One finding is very clear. If learners don't do something with the feedback, it's not likely to be very effective. So what they do can be as important as what you do. So what do they do with it? A plan for how do you follow up on the written corrective feedback in subsequent drafts and in subsequent assignments. Um, and this one, targeted brief instruction. Brief is subject to much debate, I guess. Um, what I mean here is really brief, like three minutes, four or five minutes in response to this, not, okay guys, I saw you had a lot of problems on um, uh, the subjunctive. So we're gonna take today to work on the subjunctive. 
That's not what we're talking about. That takes it away, takes it out of the reading. Um, having a, um, some sort of plan for learner autonomy. These are just a couple of suggestions that have come up. I kind of like the first two more than the third. Error logs, that is, things that they know that they have problems with, some ways that they can chart their own progress, make them responsible for it. Cover letters, these for, uh, to write to the teacher on top of the, of, the, um, of the assignment. This is what I'm having problems with. This is what I've been working on. This is what I'd like you to give me feedback on. And then finally, uh, training, uh, preparing peers to provide effective feedback on language issues. Probably works better at a higher level, probably not so effective at the low levels. So I'm going to finish up with some general guidelines. Um, know that time tasks will never elicit the best work from L2 writers. There are lots of high stakes writing, time writing in academia. Um, entrance exams, exit exams, final exams, placement exams. They will never do their best writing when they do this. So give them the time that they need to do their best writing if you want to get something that's increased linguistic accuracy. I've said this three times already, I'll say it again. Know that there will be very little transfer between grammar lessons and student writing. There we go. Um, so make grammar lessons short, targeted, and response to student need. Encourage student autonomy. It's their problem, not yours. Encourage student accountability. Make them responsible for what you think that they, they can do, not accountable for things that they can't do. Be systematic and consistent in your written corrective feedback. Have a plan, better than ad hoc. And be informed and realistic about your expectations. You are not there, no matter who is in your class and no matter how long they're there, they are not gonna leave your class with perfect papers. It's not gonna happen. So I can make this, I think this is all going to be made available to you at some point, but these are the um, references that I was talking about. Um, the Bichner and Ferris is a book. It gets all the entire opus of um, research on second language writing, feedback on second language writing up through 2012. It contains actually most everything on this except the last one. The Hartshorn uh, TESOL quarterly one is the write it over and over and over and over again until you're error-free BYU one, but it's a very tight research study, very well done, worth looking at. Truscott is the guy in Taiwan that I mentioned. And the other one, that, uh, the, uh, this Dutch one, the von Bunningen de Jong and, and Kerken, is one that really did show the uh, superior uh, performance of direct feedback. So those might be of interest to you. So um, that's the end of my talk. Thanks for coming. And the only other thing that I want to say is, there is no magic bullet. <laughs> so yeah, 50. Well done. That's what I counted on. So I'm um, more than willing to take questions, but I don't have a magic bullet. <laughs>